Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Grams. I am Guthrie Chamberlain and we are on day 2329 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. We are continuing the messages I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past year. This is the seventh of the 11 message series covering the letter to Philippians. This message is titled, A Son and a Brother. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. Now, last week we explored working out God's inner work within our lives. And we concluded that it is only through the inner working of God's Spirit that our lives can become progressively more like Christ. We'll never be perfect as Christ was in this, this world. But each day, as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, we'll become a little bit more like Christ. And this week, we're going to continue our study to the letter at the church at Philippi. And Paul is thankful for two very close friends, as Chris talked about. Those friends that will influence us. And those friends were Timothy and Epaphroditus. And the message today is a son and a brother. In today's scriptures, Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. It's on page 1828 of the Pew Bibles, if you want to follow along, starting with verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel." I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it's necessary to send back Epaphroditus to you, my brother, my co-worker, my fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me upon sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, that you may see him again, and may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor people like him. Because he almost died for the work of Christ, he risked his life to make up for the help that you could not give me. Close friendships. It's impossible to put a price tag on them. Our relationship with some people are so significant that we start referring to them often like family. Close friends not only help us, but they have the ability to transform us. But that's why it's so important to know who we should become close friends with. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, Don't be fooled by those who say such things. For bad company corrupts good character. But on the flip side of that, good company, those close friends that you allow to influence your lives, promote good character, courage, leadership, humility, strength, faithfulness, and joyfulness. It's been said that you become like those closest by people that you hang around with. And it is so true. We're influenced by those that we spend time with. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17 says, a friend is always loyal and a brother is born to help in the time of need. Close friends prop us up when we're weak. They lift our spirits when we're down. They push us when we start to wear out. Friends motivate us, sometimes even without words, so that we can be more than we would be otherwise. As we observe They give us perseverance. They prompt us to endure hardships in our lives. As we hang around those who are servant leaders, they plant seeds of humility into our lives. As we see godly saints stare down travesty and difficulties in their lives, we learn how to have deep-seated joy with the frustrations and challenges in our own lives. We shouldn't be surprised then that God's word is filled with references and accounts of close friends, commendations of men and women who were faithful friends to others. 
Proverbs 18.24 says that, says that there are friends who destroy each other, but real friends stick closer than a brother. And Paul experienced this kind of friendship in our passage today. Those close friends, that was Timothy and Epaphroditus, two men that really propped him up. But sometimes we're tempted to think about Paul trudging through those forests and through the swamps, through the shipwrecks that he went through across dever, deserts and over mountains. And we think, well, those that were along with him, Barnabas and Silas, Luke, Mark, and Timothy, only followed behind him to carry his load, his cloaks, and his scrolls. We may view Paul as a rugged individualist, a man who didn't need anyone, per se, a lone missionary risking all for the gospel's sake. But if that's a picture we have of Paul, then it's a mistaken picture. He was an ordinary man who was needed, and he wanted, and he desired these valued friendships that he had. The friends involved with him, either directly or indirectly, in his ministry of evangelism, of church planting, of teaching, of writing, were in the dozens. We've heard many names that are written in his letters, and others that he didn't mention. From his letters alone, there's a massive amount over five dozen men and women that he named that were supporting and encouraging him, assisting Paul in his work in the ministry. And these are just the ones that he happened to mention in his letters. In our passage today, verses 19 through 30, Paul focuses on his attention on two of friends in particular who were incredibly close to him during this time when he was under house arrest in Rome. These men brought him a great encouragement, strength, comfort, and joy. One he regarded as a son, and the other he regarded as a brother. Both are worthy as a reflection as we consider the faithful friends that God has placed into our lives. If you look at your bulletin insert today on the side, it says, a son and a brother. These were partners in ministry and life. In all of Paul's writing, Timothy is the friend and ministry companion that's mentioned more than any other's. In Philippians 2, Paul informs us as readers that he would send Timothy from Rome back to the church at Philippi so that he could gain some personal news on how that church was doing. He characterized Timothy as having a kindred spirit, as someone with genuine affection for the church at Philippi. Timothy wasn't simply told to go. He wanted to go to minister to that church once again, as he had 10 years earlier. Paul said he had proved himself over these last 10 years in verse 22. Since they had ministered together for over a decade now, Paul had been able to observe Timothy in his life, in his ministry, in a variety of situations to see how he handled all sorts of challenges. He was tested and approved. He was, in fact, like a child working with his father. In years gone by where we had family farms and the children had to work with their parents day in and day out to be survive and to be successful on that farm. That is the type of ministry that Timothy had with Paul. It wasn't farming crops, but it was farming churches and people. It reminded me of that close friendship that we now have with our children. We've gone beyond the parent-child relationships, and now we're friends with our children in the ministry of life, working with them, encouraging them, ministering with them. And that's how we should look at those that are friends in our lives. But who was this young figure that played so prominently in Paul's life? his life in the ministry, in his life, in just everyday life. And why does he appear, appear so frequently in his writings? When Paul first encountered Timothy, it was about AD 50. It was during the first months of his second missionary journey. He'd gone out with Barnabas the first time around, came back. Barnabas and Paul split up into two different camps, and he met Timothy in Lystra, and he heard these Christians in Lystra speaking about this young man who was really earnestly working for the Lord. 
Though Timothy's father was a Gentile, and some assume because of that he was an unbeliever, Timothy was steeped in the Old Testament scriptures, thanks to his mother, Jewish mother Eunice, and his grandmother Lois, as told in 2 Timothy. Paul found that Timothy was an ideal apprentice. He was just a young man, maybe even a teenager at this time. And much like himself, he was scripturally astute. He was a devout, a devout follower of Christ. But he had one foot in the Jewish camp, the Jewish world, and the other foot in the Gentile world. He was the perfect person that Paul was seeking. He had that perfect packed background for Paul's ministry. Paul's ministry, as he tells us in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he went to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. For Timothy to become part of, part of Paul's ministry, though, among those Jews that he went to first, he had to be circumcised, as it says in Acts 16.3. But this wasn't for spiritual or scriptural reasons. It wasn't required for any of his acceptance before God. But it was for a practical reason. Paul considered himself primarily an apostle to the Gentiles, as it tells us in Ephesians chapter 3. But whenever he entered a new city, he always went to the synagogue first to take the gospel to the Jews that were in that city before he went to the marketplace where the Gentiles were. And for Timothy to accompany Paul into those Jewish portions of his ministry, for him to have access to the community in the synagogue, he had to be circumcised. Otherwise, he would not be permitted to enter into that synagogue. His willingness to do something that wasn't obligatory as a Christian, but was suitable for the ministry to help him to be more effective, showed his passion for that mission. So after the years passed, Paul also found Timothy a kindred spirit as it says in verse 20 of our passage today. And that term translated kindred spirit is isoselkos. It comes from two Greek words, isos meaning equal, and psyche meaning soul or mind. It is essentially being of like one, like mind, or having much in common. Like Paul, Timothy was studious. He was sensitive, and he was dedicated to his mission. In time, Paul also came to see Timothy as a reflection of his ministry priorities, his methods, and sending this true son of the faith, as it says in 1 Timothy 1-2, to solve problems that Paul would have had to gone and done himself if he didn't have Timothy with him. He often sent Timothy to these churches to help to minister, even though Paul couldn't physically be there himself. On his second missionary journey, Paul was worried about the churches in Macedonia and particularly in Thessalonica. And he was afraid that because of the Jewish persecution that this church was facing, that they would succumb and go back to their old ways. So he sent Timothy to them to strengthen and encourage the members of that church, as we're told in 1 Thessalonians. And during his third missionary journey, he sent Timothy and his friend Erastus ahead to Ephesus to prepare the churches in Macedonia and Greece for his visit, as we're told in Acts 19. Then in final preparation for his long-anticipated journey to Spain, that was Paul's heart is to finally go to Spain because that was, at that point, the outermost regions of the world, known world. And he wanted to bring the gospel to that area. And he knew this was after he was released from his current imprisonment in Rome. He went on to Spain, came back, and was rearrested and probably executed shortly after that. And he knew he might not see his pupils again. So he sent Timothy in charge of the church of Ephesus. The church in Ephesus was the most strategically placed church in all of Asia. It was situated in the center of a pagan philosophy, and the church would be most susceptible to that pagan corruption. But he knew that if he sent Timothy there, that he, the church would be in good hands, that they would be taught the word of God, and that that church could thrive under Timothy. And this was how much of an apprentice, how much of a partner Timothy was with Paul. But Paul also mentions a second good friend in verses 25 through 30. And this friend only appears one time in the scripture, and that's in the book of Philippians, both in chapter 2 and about chapter 4. But this brief snapshot gives us a clear picture of Paul's friend. To Paul, Epaphroditus was a brother, he says. 
a fellow worker, a fellow soldier, a messenger, a minister, in verse 25. And while visiting Paul from Philippi to deliver a financial gift to Paul's ministry from that church in Philippi, Epaphroditus fell very ill, teetering on the brink of death. And what I find most remarkable is that while he was deathly sick, though, Epaphroditus was distressed because he was worrying what the Philippians would think about his illness that he had caught. But thankfully, God had mercy on Epaphroditus and restored him to health, relieving both the Philippians and Paul of the anxiety that they were having over the illness and near death of Epaphroditus. Though having a faithful friend in Rome would have been ideal for Paul, because Epaphroditus helped him so much. The Apostle Paul was willing to send Epaphroditus back to that church at Philippi to deliver the very letter that he was writing at that time to the church on Paul's behalf. You might say, well, why didn't Paul keep him around? He could have sent it by some other courier or some other person. Well, Paul likely wanted to ease the minds of those believers back in Philippi because they're the ones that sent Epaphroditus to Paul to deliver this gift for his ministry. But they were worried about Epaphroditus' safety and his health and probably wondering, well, maybe they made a mistake in sending him in the first place. If they hadn't sent him, maybe he wouldn't have become ill and almost die. So Epaphroditus was sent back to his home church. And it was an excellent way of Paul saying thank you to the church at Philippi for their contribution to his ministry. Now, Paul knew Epaphroditus would return to the Philippians and that they would rejoice because of this in verses 28 and 29. However, it is possible that some within that church at Philippi might have thought, maybe he failed in his mission and that's why Paul's sending him back to us. Maybe he failed in his purpose of going there. Maybe he, they expected him not only to deliver that financial support that they sent with him, but also provide physical assistance while Paul was still remained in imprisonment there in Rome. Paul perhaps, per, or perhaps some in Philippi might have thought that he was a quitter and just came home. But if so, Paul painted an entirely different picture of this man. He expected the church to receive him warmly, as verse 29 tells us. Welcome him in the Lord's love and with great joy and give the, him the honor that people like him deserve. And as a result of this long journey, and he almost lost his life for the cause of Christ. And on behalf of the church at Philippi, in verse 30, Epaphroditus was welcomed back, not as a loser at all, but as a homegrown hero and an example for all of them. And that's what we are to be to others as an example of the faith. And that's why it's so important as we associate with close friends that those people that we associate with are an example of Christ to us. But what's the application in our passage today? It's on the other side of your bulletin insert. insert. The application of Philippians 2, verses 19 through 30 is two orders of friends, and two orders means two examples of friends. Our closing hymn today, we're going to be singing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Good old hymn. In the first part of the stanza goes, What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. That word uh, old, of that old hymn reminds us that Jesus is not just our God, our Savior, our King, but he is also a close personal friend to each of us. He is available to anyone at any time. He exemplifies selfless humility. He exemplifies sacrificial love. He exemplifies patience toward people who can never repay him for his affection toward us. In the body of Christ, we've also been given a role reflection, a tangible measure of friendships of Christ. For Paul, it was Timothy and Epaphroditus. They were such friends who exhibited Christ's likeness in their character to Paul that it boosted his ministry. And let's consider a little bit more closely those two friends of Paul and think how they apply to our lives. First, the order or the example of Timothy. Can you name someone like Timothy, someone that you've seen grow 
into unself an unselfish adult. Perhaps someone in whom you've invested your time, your energy, your encouragement, and your support. There are few things more rewarding than to have a mentor for Timothy, as Paul was to Timothy. It reminds me once again of their, our own children who we've been able to pour our lives into, and they become more of our friends to us, co-workers in the gospel of Christ. Maybe God is calling you to that kind of friendship to somebody. Perhaps you can help them further their education or support them in their work or their ministry or take them under your wing and mentor them and counsel them through difficult times of life as we all go through. Those of us who have been through difficult times need to be there for those younger people that are going through those difficult times. Or maybe you need to be a Timothy to someone else. Lord has blessed Putnam with many people who have lived long lives. Maybe we need to step in and help those and become a Timothy to those that are older than us. God may be calling you to minister humbly in a place of service to them, showing genuine concern for their concerns, relieving the stress and the burdens that they might be facing with a servant's heart because you can be a Timothy no matter what your age is. The next is the order or the example of Epaphroditus. This was a person who risked it all for the call of Christ and his service to Christ. He was willing, are you willing to join the ranks of Epaphroditus? The truth is that every time that we minister to somebody in need, we risk ourselves in some way or, or fashion every time. You risk being taken advantage of when you help others. You risk being misunderstood. You risk being ostracized by others. There's no ministry ministering to others without some sort of risk in our lives, whether it's great or small. Too often, I think, in our Western world, we become complacent, seeking comfort and control over our lives rather than taking even a minimal risk for the gospel of Christ. Are you willing to start risking in order to serve for Christ? Have you felt the Spirit nudging toward certain ways that you can minister to others? Decisions that might change your world, but have a big impact on the world of others. And every time, it'll be worth it. How do you respond to the Epaphroditus in your life? those who have come to minister to you. Do you hold them in high regard? Or do we see Epaphroditus as helping others and say, why are you wasting your time and risking everything? Think about your own future. But instead, we need to lend our prayers, our support, our encouragement to those who are out ministering to others. When we do that, we step into the order of Epaphroditus or the example of Epaphroditus. Because someone will inevitably say, don't waste your time with so-and-so. They may not appreciate it. But whether somebody appreciates our help or not isn't the question. We don't minister to others to be ministered back to necessarily. We minister to others because it's the call of Christ on our lives to help others who are in need of help regardless of whether we will receive anything back from it. So whether you're an Epaphroditus or a Timothy, whether you're ministering to a Timothy or an Epaphroditus, do it all for the glory of Christ. The great Roman statement Cicero once said, he indeed who looks into the face of a friend, as it were, sees a copy of himself. Those that you hang around with most, when you look at them, do you see a reflection of yourself, as Chris said in the children's message? It's like looking in the mirror of your friends. Do you see a reflection of what you provide to them? Do you see your reflection in your friends? Do you want to be more Christ-like? In order to do so, let's be 
a friend to the Timothys in the Epaphroditus of our lives. Those who exhibit Christ-like characters that will challenge and transform us. And that's what we're to do, mutually benefit each other as believers to challenge and transform our lives to become more like Christ on a daily basis. That's what Paul is wanting to share with us in this passage today. Now, next week, we'll continue studying Philippians, and we're going to move on to part three, which is chapter three, and it's joy and sharing, and we'll compare trusting in our own achievements to trusting in Christ's accomplishments in a message titled, Human Rubbish Versus Divine Righteousness or Right Living. So please read Philippians chapter three, verses one through 11 in preparation for next week. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for those, those that are here today. We thank you for your blessing to us, Father, as a church. May we be an impact on this local community for your kingdom and indeed throughout the entire world. May we become Timothys and Epaphroditus. May we minister to those who are Timothy to us and Epaphroditus to us in order that both those that we minister to and those who minister to us, Father, make us more like Christ, that we might impact the lives of those around us, Father, ultimately to point them to your kingdom. We pray this in I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.